Hello, everyone, and welcome to this gathering for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the General Council Offices of United Church, and I coordinate this program. Tonight, we are, today we are here to um, uh, engage with race talks from Gen Zs. And uh, we have a panel here for a conversation uh, that we will engage in shortly. Uh, but first, just a little bit of background about the 40 days and what's happening this week. Um, this week has a particular focus on Indigenous and racialized children and youth uh, and young adults. <clears throat> and so in addition to this talk, there are um, some written reflections that are posted online, um, which are uh, have lots of tips and tools and uh, some insights. As well, uh, there are several books that are featured throughout the 40 Days series. Um, this is the full collection here, uh, but this week in particular, we're highlighting two. Uh, one is called I'm a Change Maker, which is about teaching anti-racism with children. This is a brand new United Church resource that came out earlier this year. Um, it's, uh, it offers uh, six sessions to move through reflections on scripture and um, ways of working with um, children age six to 10. It can be used in Sunday schools and many other places and spaces. It's available from the United Church bookstore. The second book that we're highlighting is How to Raise an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, um, which is a great book on for anyone who works with um, children of raising up children um, to think about anti-racism in, in all the ways and spaces that they can. So lots of great tips and tools in this practical book. And uh, if you use the code 40 days, um, it will be valid for a discount of 15% of orders of two or more books. So United Church Bookstore has these books and more. As well, there's a weekly newsletter about the 40 days that offers perspectives. This is the most recent one here. Um, it's a great way to keep up to date. So I've mentioned books, there's, um, there's a social media group. Uh, there's lots of things that are happening around the 40 days and the newsletter is a great way to stay up to date. Um, the full link is here, but if you just go to united-church.ca and search for 40 days, um, you'll be able to pull that up and find all of that. So with that, uh, we can move right into our panel conversation or panel discussion. Um, Emo Yango is one of my staff colleagues at the General Counsel Office, and uh, he's going to introduce the panel. He was one of the facilitators for the Indigenous and Racialized Youth Programs. Uh, summer program, and uh, he will facilitate the panel and also introduce everyone who will be speaking. So thank you, Emil. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Emil Yango, the Growth Coordinator for New Emerging Migrant and Diasporic Communities of Faith. I'm happy to share, though, that since the beginning of the new strategic plan in January 2023, the United Church is engaged in 23 new church plant locations. And one of these is the continuing development of an Indigenous racialized youth interfaith community. In 2021, as part of the United Church commitment to the International Decade for People of African Descent, we started a program called the Young Black Scholars. The Young Black Scholars included six young, young, pe young people aged 17 to 26, and a mixture of those in the younger end of Gen Y and the older end of Gen Z. They each researched a topic related to experiences of racism and presented their findings using creative art forms in, in the event like tonight's. This year, Springwater Hester Miyawasige, staff of the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit, and I worked together and coordinated con to continue the program and widen its scope to become Indigenous Racialized Young Scholars Program. This year's participants included eight Indigenous racial and racialized young people aged 18 to 24, or what we would identify as Generation Z. Fittingly, we're calling tonight's event Race Talks with Gen Zs. Originally, two racialized and one indigenous young people were to present their research findings. Unfortunately, earlier today, I received a message from Eli Dunlop, a two-spirited indigenous young person is studying law and society at Acadia University and he sends his regrets that he will have to miss tonight's event for the health reasons. His presentation would have examined the connections between environmental racism. Um, let me, my apologies again. Yeah, 
um, Eli's presentation would have examined the connections between environmental racism, um, primarily water injustices through a case study of Grassy Narrows First Nations and Indigenous Youth Suicide. A summary or a video of his report will be included in the recording of this event and will be shared later in Church Acts. Now, fortunately, one of the other young scholars is available tonight to share his research findings. So tonight's presenters and their respective topics are Inzwi Muniqua. Her topic is in epigenetics and in particular the effects of racism on the bodies of Black and African people stemming from factors such as enslavement and colonization. The other is Ryan Kissy. His research examines how Canadian society treats Black men, focusing on various forms of racism and their impacts. And then there's, there's Sarah Yang. Her research seeks to display how systemic racism in Canadian society informs relations between Indigenous and racialized peoples, even with diversity or equity policies in place. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce you and let's begin the Young Scholars presentation. The first presenter is Inzwi Muniqua. Inzwi is in her fourth year of studies at McMaster University, focusing on becoming a lawyer. Inzwi was born in Zimbabwe and came to Canada when she was 10 years old. All to you, Inzwi. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing well today. Um, let me just share my screen here. All right. So as Emma mentioned, uh, my research is specifically um, in racism, in our, is about racism in our bodies. Um, it seeks um, to explore the physical effects of racism um, that, ha that it has on the bodies of Black and African people in Canada and why it is essential to be educated on its implications. Um, so as the United Church, they have uh, has had conversations surrounding racism for at least the past decade with three objectives of strategic plan, of the strategic plan being Indigenous pathways, growth, um, and justice. Um, so basically, we do talk a lot about what racism does to the mental um, well-being of racialized and Indigenous people. However, I have found uh, no research or no talks within the church about what it does to the physical uh, body. Um, so first, I'd like to talk about what is what are epigenetics. Epigenetics encompass the changes in one's DNA that result in genetic mutations, which influence diseases from external environmental factors. The changes within one's DNA can be inherited over generations, therefore making populations more susceptible to certain diseases over time. The stressors that cause epigenetic changes are influenced by the social, political, physical environments, and mental factors that people encounter in their daily lives. Well, although many face environmental and psychological stressors that lead to epigenetic changes, for Black and African populations living in Canada, these stressors are amplified and more frequent opposed to their white counterparts. Racism and discrimination against Black and African people is deeply rooted in Canadian history through the transatlantic slave trade and the colonization of Africa by European countries. So even in today's world, uh, we still see that race and racism are still a big topic and racism is still a problem. Race itself is just a social construct that it was made to divide people and classify them in stratifications within society. However, racism, the result of such a stratification system, takes away access of social and material resources, freedom, autonomy, equality, and equity from Black and African people. The effects of systemic and structural racism on health outcomes. So lacking these sources, uh, resources leads to negative health outcomes and causes epigenetic changes that not only affect the person who goes through the racist and discriminatory experiences, but it also affects the generations after them. Due to systemic and uh, structural racism, 
Black and African people residing in Canada still face negative health outcomes and are more susceptible to certain health complications, such as diabetes, cardiovascular problems, and shorter life expectancies, as well as mental health issues due to racism. Okay. Uh, racism is a stressor that is not always anticipated by African immigrants, as many are not um, prepared for the struggles that come with being uh, racialized, a racialized individual in Canada and in the United Church of Canada. African immigrants are then pulled into a world that does not always readily accept them, causing psychological turmoil, which contributes to mental health struggles such as anxiety, depression, high levels of stress, which become catalysts to certain physical health complications and negative health outcomes. So for my, um, for my research, I interviewed three Zimbabwean immigrants uh, who came to Canada at different times and were at different points in their lifetimes. So uh, first I interviewed Liberty, who's a 42 year old male. Uh, he came in 2022. He, came, he was supposed to come with his family. However, due to immigration complications, his family later joined him in 2023. Coming alone was a challenge for him, as he expressed that it was difficult coming from a social society in Zimbabwe to one that was more isolating and individualistic. He was also surprised that although he was fluent in English, communicating with his colleagues and those around him was difficult, as they were unable to understand him due to his accent, and at times he was unable to understand them. Um, uh, Liberty noted that he was aware that racism was ex existed in Canada. However, he did not expect it to be as blunt um, in how he experienced it and also how his children experienced it. He has found support from some members of his church, uh, but he has recommendations for the church and for um, other organizations that welcome new uh, newcomers to Canada. He wishes there were workshops available for people in the United Church of Canada to learn about diverse newcomers and the ways to make them feel more comfortable and less isolated when they come here. Uh, second, I also interviewed Daniel. He's a 30-year-old male who came to Canada in 2019 to further his studies. He also stated that the transition was not easy at all. There was a lot of emotional, mental, and psychological stress. He also found it difficult to be away from his family, and due to being social, he missed the social and communal aspect of Zimbabwe, as he felt he could not befriend others as easily in, in a society due to the way his friendship advances may have been viewed as a Black man. He also had ad advice for the United Church of Canada, uh, stating that other institutions in Canada should create um, visible communities that newcomers have access to and can lean on as they adjust to their new world. Lastly, I, in, I interviewed a 13-year-old female. Her name is TJ. She came here in 2014. Although TJ does not remember much of her life before moving to Canada, she says being in Canada is pretty good uh, and it gave her a diverse outlook on life. However, she noted that it was difficult to find people to connect with who are from Zimbabwe. Um, and grew up in similar circumstances. She says she has experienced microaggressions, stating, it's more kids trying to be funny than like turning the lights off and asking, where is TJ? Or the teacher censoring me and other black kids from saying the N-word because it confuses the other kids on why they can't say it. Um, she says, why can they just teach other kids not to say it? She also finds it frustrating um, how other kids claim to be not racist racist, but instead are funny racist. TJ's advice to the United Church of Canada is to invite more racialized people to the church and do more fun things. So as a result of my interviews, um, there were no results or there was no evidence to physical effects of racism. However, they addressed a lot of difficulties Black and African people encounter in their lives and how it affects them. It is also important to address that a lot of the physical effects of racism become more evident over periods of years. Research shows that racism does not affect one person, but the physical consequences affect those in the future generations. Epigenetic research highlights that we do not only carry or deal with the trauma of today, but we also have the burden of the trauma of our ancestors. It is not easy to make systemic and structural changes overnight to eliminate racism. However, it is essential to start making changes and listen to those afflicted by racism and to prepare and make those coming into the United Church of Canada feel comfortable as they encounter a world that does not always offer understanding and comfort. 
Okay, so we also we also did a creative piece for our research during the summer. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute so I can share um, my creative uh, piece. Just bear with me <laughs> for a second. All right. All right. So for my creative piece, I wrote a, uh, three different poems that kind of express how I feel uh, as a Black woman, as an immigrant, and as an African living in Canada. Part one, wonder. I wonder what you think about when you leave the house. Did I take everything? Where are my keys? Because I think, do I have my ID? Do my clothes look non-threatening? I wonder what you think about when you are in a store. Do I need this or do I just want it? Because I think I haven't taken anything, so why are they following me? Don't forget the receipt because they'll ask for it at the exit. I wonder what you think about when you go to school. I can't wait to see my friends. When am I ever going to use algebra? Because I think I hope no one says the N word to me again today. I wonder what you think about when you go to church. I've really enjoyed this song. Because I think, I hope no one touches my hair without asking. Yes, I know my English is good. I have been bilingual since the age of four. I wonder what crosses your mind when you hear police sirens. When you watch the news and see another shooting of a racialized person. When your path comes across a black person. Why you only heard grace when I introduced myself as Inzwirashe Grace Manigua. I wonder if like me, you wonder about this too. Part two, don't be sensitive. It's not always about race. Then why am I terrified when I leave home, but you're not? Why am I followed in shoppers, but you're not? Why does my body tense up around white people, but yours does not? Why do both my hands have to be visible when I reach for my wallet, but yours do not? It has nothing to do with white privilege. Then why were my multiple degrees not enough, but the one you have was? Why was my English not proficient enough, but yours was? Why was I asked, are you supposed to be here? But you were not. Why was I told to calm down when I disagreed, but you were not? Why do I need to climb a thousand steps to get far, but you do not? Why can't you let it go? It was centuries ago. Then why do my genes remember? Every panic attack, every anxious thought, every doctor's checkup is a reminder a reminder of slavery, a reminder of colonization, a reminder of trauma, a reminder that this is not over. Why have you forgotten? Why do you not remember? Why do you not hear my cries as I yell, Black Lives Matter? Why aren't you listening? Why are you always talking? When you say equality, I say, what about equity? When you preach all are welcome, I ask, where is my seat? You're right, it's not about race. It's about the systemic racism. It's about white supremacy. It's about white privilege. It's about separate but equal. It's about you. Part three, keeping it brief. I had a dream that one day, yeah, we're still dreaming. All lives matter, except mine. The church thrives for justice for all, except me. You just repeated yourself in all your poems. So, it's redundant, but I have to. Why are you getting angry? Because I had to repeat myself. Then why did you? Because you didn't hear what I said. All you heard was complaining. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to echo what Adele has said. That uh, please, uh, th each presenter will be doing a fifteen-minute presentation, and after each one, at, all three had presented, we'll have another fifteen minute of question and answer. Where so you can you folks can jot your questions down and ask them later. Thank you very much. Apologies again for the mic. Um, the next one, uh, the next presenter will be Ryan Kissy. He is originally from Zimbabwe and is living in Edmonton, He's studying interior design at Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. Take it away, Ryan. Hello, my name is Ryan, and I'm going to be presenting on the effects of racism on black people. 
So let me just share my presentation so I can start. Okay. So I titled it Evolving Expectations, the Impact of Racism on Society's Perceptions and Expectations of Black Men in Canada and its Effects on Their Lives. What I was uh, mostly looking at was the historical context of racism, also identifying the systematic racism and its effects on the Black community, how society treats Black people and sees them, also how other people have experienced racism in Canada. I also looked at possible solutions to racism and how to live in Canada through racism and fight it. So this quote from Shane Augustine is, Black history is not just for Black people. Black history is Canadian history. Which basically means whatever happens to one group of people is part of the whole society. It just does not affect everyone. It might not, it might not affect you directly, but you're affected in one way or the other. Now, the misconceptions about racism in Canada are the media portrays it like Canada is a diverse country with a lot of cultures and there's no racism, but there is racism in Canada and it's most of it is subtle racism. It's um, macroaggressions. Also, the people have their own misconceptions about race, about other races. Most people tend to look at black men as being aggressive, as being rowdy, as being irresponsible. And they, whenever they see a black man in a shop, most of the guards will follow you around, all those sort of things. It's a misconception. Just because someone is black does not mean that they'll, they'll rob you. And just because they're black does not mean they're always angry at something. Now, other realities, the, there is a very high unemployment rate among the Black community in Canada compared to other group, other group of races. This is mostly down to the fact that most of the people in power are not Black people or people of color. They're mostly white people, and they tend to take in one of their own. And this... This also leads to other social problems because if without employment, people would tend to look for other means of supporting themselves. And in terms of criminal justice, black people are one of the minorities in Canada, but they are part of the majority of groups of people incarcerated in, in jails. Most of them are for petty crimes. Uh, the most crimes that most other people would have gotten a warning from or just defined. And also, it also comes down to how the society treats them. And then looking at all the impacts of racism, it leads to drug abuse, the lack of sense of belonging, isolation, and, and also families are destroyed because if, the, if, one, pers if one parent is not is not part of the family, cannot provide for the family and is in jail, the sense of family is broken. Now, this is, I came to Canada to get an education and I expected to, to get polite people and I was told there's no racism in Canada by the media. So I was expecting to be treated equally, but what I found out was very different from what I was expecting because there's such a racism. You face obstacles wherever you go and you don't get as much support as you thought you would. Now, my personal experience was the most, the biggest challenge I faced is finding employment. And that also leads to mental health issues and feelings of marginalization. Now in the system, you get to pay more fees than other people because you're an immigrant and there really is lack of proper support in your academics or any other issues that you may have, which leads to a fear of you might get deported anytime. 
Now, uh, looked at the other experiences of other black people in Canada. Joshua, who is a 23 year old black man, came here when he was 15 and he faced a lot of racism when he was in high school. He was bullied because of his hair, because of how he looked. Also, like uh, how Inzi said, the use of the N word, he was taught that you, had, you could not say it. And there were really was no thing of the other kids cannot say it. You cannot say it so the other kids can say it. Then David is a 30 year old and he also experienced, uh, he came here when he was in his 20s. And the thing that affected him most was finding employment, choosing his qualifications from his country. He had to go back to school so that he could get a job. And Lee is a 54 year old male. And in his experiences, he said it has not changed much in the past 20 years. So, so it's it's something that has been a problem in all. It's a it's something that has been a problem in all age groups. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of ending racism. Now, when we're identifying the aggressor and the victim in this. We have to look at the, the system as being the aggressor and the person as being the victim. The implicit bias and the microaggression, the institutional and systematic racism, the white supremacy, that would be the aggressor. And then the victim will have to be, and the victim will have to be the mental health, the independence, the family, the economic independence, and the person as a whole. Uh, this affects the black men in many ways. You, in terms of psychology and social effects, you mental health of this is affected, and and also even though it's a bad thing, it ends up it ends up uh, providing other people with employment because they get to research on how this is affecting the the people. Also, the economic implications are you don't have employment, you're discriminated by society because you can provide for yourself. There's also a big racial wealth gap. And, and then you, the society loses out on a lot of potential work, workforce, labor, intellectuals, because they are not utilizing everyone. They are choosing who to, who to use, who, to, who should work for them. Would, should help them out instead of me taking it up on merit. They're using color. Now, if you need to, now you, if you need to understand racism, you have to look at yourself and see where you fit in. Are you a racist? Are you the racist person? Are you a victim? Are you a supporter or are you a defender? It's a question you have to ask yourself and look at how did you react to the to a situation when you saw that someone was being racist to someone or someone was being marginalized because of their color? Did you say anything? Did you just look on and, and leave? Did you say something? Did you do anything? Or was it you who was being the racist? And there is no way we would encourage anyone to be a racist or a supporter of racism. It's not, it's not conducive in this society. It's bad for anyone else to feel racism. So we have to look at ourselves and think of ourselves as defenders and as victims, if we are, and find ways to fight racism. Also, you have, after, like I said before, reflecting on your behavior and looking at ways to better yourself as a person so that you can, you don't come out as being racist and you don't affect other people in your ways and what you say. You always have to think of the other person. How would this make them feel? Or how would this affect their lives? Would this be something that will be will have a negative impact on their life? Or would this be something that will have a positive impact on their life? We have to always do something. And if you are not, you have to start thinking differently. So... The things that victims can do are not much because 
most of the systems or most of the solutions that are there are the ones that are causing the problems for them. They're part of the system. So you have to go to uh, groups like the United Canada Church, to the like the United Church of Canada, or to therapy, go get therapy or activists, or even look uh, go to your community for other people who stand against racism, and they will stand up for you. In cases where you can, you can involve the police. But if it's the police who is being racist to you you have to end up and seek out from professional groups. Now, this is the art piece that I did on racism. And looking at it, the word negus is, which means king in the Ethiopian language. And so you can see the person is wearing his crown, his black identity, and it's been used to hold him in place to cause pain to him by the white supremacy and the chains. So all the other like BLM, Black Lives Matter, it's what comes out of it. It's a way of people trying to fight against it. It also like all those other stuff cause crime, drug abuse, isolation, people are drowning in debt. And there's a lot of mental health issues caused from which comes out from this. So yeah. That was my presentation and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Ryan. And again, we will come back to you later uh, after the next presentation for Q and A from all the other folks and uh, we'll give a short a summary again. And the next one and the last one, but not least is Sarah Yang. Sarah is um, was born in Winnipeg of Korean descent and she just started her first year at McMaster University. All to you. Thank you, Emma. Um, can you pull up the PowerPoint for me, please? Thank you. So this is my presentation. Um, <laughs> uh, so basically my research primarily focuses on um, the systemic structures and racism, as well as how that impacts um, indigenous and racialized relationships even though we have um, formal equality and DEI practices and policies involved. Uh, next slide, please. So I like to call this the three C's, capitalism, colonialism, and culture, and how they affect all of us, um, but then especially how that effect is exacerbated on racialized and indigenous peoples. And so we must ask ourselves who are being left behind? Um, so just as ML has kind of mentioned, um, I'm now in university. And so people would tell me um, about applying to scholarships and um, different resources and equality or equities that were being afforded to me and how I can take advantage of certain parts of who I am, such as my race or my gender or my um, physical capabilities and to use that for uh, building and enriching my own financial success in the long run and make as much money as they possibly can. And that's kind of a truth in a world with capitalism, colonialism, and it's embedded within the culture that we have. Next slide. So of course, that experience is not just mine, of course, many people think that way, that you need to work more, work harder, get a good job. Um, but so this here is specifically called the Pyramid of Petty Tyrants, as posed by sociologist Albert Memmi. And so it's it's me basically accepting this position um, behind whiteness and me playing into the model minority myth, for example. Next slide. So a way that people try to get, or a way that racialized and indigenous people sometimes try to be eco economically mobile and reach for that upward success is through commodifying oneself. And so this can be seen through this Melly Lunch story. Um, so for me, I guess that would be like bringing kimchi to school and how that's very palatable 
by uh, white people and how it's very easy to consume and therefore it's being produced out in the open for everyone. And so there's, it creates a certain expectation on indigenous and racialized peoples about how we are in the media and what that represents. And it also creates a very superficial understanding about race as it is usually also followed up then by a story of success and how it was overcome. And so it, it, it poses the question, what nuances of our experiences do we lose to a culture interested in our trauma? Next slide, please. So a different take to this secondary position and reaching this, this success that can really only truly be realized by white people oftentimes is the fact of preserving cultural integrity. And we can see this through um, uh, Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Torre, who was a prominent figure in the US and he also went to school here in Canada as well for black power. And so he says, the racial and cultural personality of the black community must be preserved and the community must win its freedom preserving its cultural integrity. And so the Anglo conformity position assumes what is good for America is good for white people. But as he says, he rejects this notion, which is completely different to maybe the ways that I, as an Asian person, have kind of aligned with complicity and being complicit to white su supremacy and the social hi hierarchy that follows. Next slide, please. So now, because especially as an Asian person and other racialized immigrants, um, compared to indigenous people, th there comes this achievement gap. As because now, because um, indigenous people are so entrenched in that colonial legacy in which they were forced to assimilate into the culture that um, was not theirs by force, then there's this achievement gap where we have racialized people competing with each other for this secondary position and to gain that financial and economic wealth where indigenous people are left outside of the conversation and the discussion. And so as such, racialized peoples may find that may um, gain this these stereotypes for indigenous people, such as being lazy or alcoholics, right? Those are reinforced by this structure that has been informed by colonialism, culture, and again, the American or Canadian dream. Next slide. So it's quite obvious that the system is inherently racist. This is built within to the structures and embeds itself into the culture and therefore affects our biases as racialized people and indigenous people and white people and other people that we have in our worldwide community. So what is formal equality? What are these policies, these DEI policies, what is multiculturalism? Just as Ryan said, he thought it'd be good. Canada would be a good place to come to with no racism because there's so many different people around. How could there be racism? And so it really, you have to ask yourself, what kind of position do I have where I am and how does that affect the others in my community? Next slide, please. So this isn't just found in Canada and the US, of course, but because of globalization, it's been the ideology of capitalism and not just the ideology, of course, but the physical movement of capitalism, culture, and colonialism has spread. And it's embedded into the history, again, of our, our books and our world. And so there's we need to see 
how even just our consumption practices and how us living here in Canada might affect racialized and other people um, around the world. Um, next slide, please. So now we can see it like, how is this important for the United Church? And so something interesting that's been happening with intersectionality, which is essentially the essence of my presentation, is that it's often being depoliticized as is, as it's been taken out of its social justice framework. And so it, it poses this big question of how should we talk about racism as well as anti-racism? Because anti-racism is not just being opposed to racism. There is more factors and more issues that culminate within racialized and in indigenous relationships that will make anti-racism a more nuanced objective. Next slide, please. And so one of these things is by creating space. Space for me, use space for indigenous and racialized peoples to come together. As in the real world, in different situations, we're often pitted against each other into competition oftentimes leaving Indigenous people outside. And so now I would like to share my um, creative piece. Thank you. So it's called Her Shoes. And around the poem is a bunch of excerpts and passages from different poets, such as Langston Hughes, um, Sherman Alexi and Ocean Vong and kind of their experiences of having a dream and how that affects their own journeys while navigating Canada and America in different historical contexts. So, her shoes. What would you do? Step on the black girl shoe? Cry your tears and dry your eyes on that white man's lies. No money and no meat, but a devastating hunger down the street. You'll see. As she throws down, as she throws rocks down the bend, thought they used to do that too by the stream and grassy lands. The burning sun sizzling at his hardened hands when he labored at the factory that day. She lives in squalor, thought coarse hair and all, but you pay no mind for a dream yea tall is you stepping on another's scuff shoe. So here I'm trying to, see, to ask, what would you do? What kind of privilege do you have? What kind of privilege will you utilize? to oppress other peoples for your own gain, economically, financially, um, and in terms of you, the, the success that is defined as most important by the culture in which we live in. So yes, that was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, um, for articulating the, uh, the, the that we are in a, uh, systemic living into systemic racism um at the same time the effects of that folks we come to that point where you have it's your turn to ask questions whether you put it in the uh, chat or you can raise hand and orally uh, ask it but we just uh, ask you to be brief in your questions please so we can as we utilize the next 15 minutes Any uh, starters? If not, let me ask a question to you, not to the three. Uh, let me start the, the questioning. Um, Sarah, you ended with creating space. So for the three of you, what has the United Church of Canada done to create space for you to be able to articulate, express, and perhaps a, a to, to even to 
we to 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 begin to relate to ing, indigenous people in this country called uh, Turtle Island. Um, I mean, well, for starters, they they've brought up programs for us like the camp and this as well, so that we can talk about what's going on in our lives and also the indigenous people can relate to us what's going on to them and we can find a middle ground or get to know each other better. So I feel like the church is doing more than enough at this point. In Zuisera, any in any specific thing that you you I, um I, items or piece that comes to your mind in this regard. Thank you, um, Ryan. I think for me, it started maybe two, three years ago, which is very interesting because I've been part of the United Church for like almost 10 years. Um, and that was the creation of the Indigenous and Racialized Youth Retreat. I feel like that was the very first time I was like, I, I felt that the United Church was actually acknowledging me as, um, you know, as a Black youth specifically. Um, because I feel like all the time we hear like the church is trying to be anti-racist, the church is doing this, but I was like, okay, but like none of this has anything to do with me. Um, but like three years ago, when I heard there was going to be an indigenous and racialized youth retreat, I was very excited because I was like, this is a space specifically that's made for indigenous and racialized youth, you know, that's specifically made with me in mind. Um, which is very different from other youth events I've been to. So I feel like that was the, that for me, that was the very first step I saw in the United Church um, trying to support me. Yes, um, I also agree with Insi as well. Um, the kind of establishing, creating um, the indigenous and racialized youth retreat, for me, of course, at first was scary because I've never had a kind of space like that. Um, for me to have uh, to be involved in, and also to listen to others and their experiences and learn from them as well, be because usually I felt like as my um kind of topic that in different situations that weren't specific for indigenous and racialized people to talk, um, there for me would often be feelings of superiority and inferiority and therefore that would impact the way that I would um, talk to people but at this retreat there there was a, a ground where I felt I could speak openly and I could also listen openly there because there wasn't other confounding variables that would take me out of it and put me out to somewhere where I kept thinking, yes, I need this and this and this to make me feel like I'm the most successful, to make me feel like I will be the most successful. No, I, I didn't. That wasn't the objective there. And so I look back with very fond thoughts and I hope it continues to grow in the future. Thank you, folks. Uh, thank you for the, your reply and uh, for at least uh, articulating that on behalf of the United Church of Canada. We should probably tap ourselves on the shoulder, but the, the work has just begun. So that's not uh, in the, that shouldn't be happening yet. Uh, this is from uh, Franklin James. Uh, each presenter has been to Canada for some time. What are some of the lessons of resilience you have learned and can pass on to youth who are new to Canada? Any takers who wants to begin? Each one of you spoke from your own experience, so there's gotta be some uh, experience of resilience, so go ahead. I can go. Yep, go ahead, Angie, um, please. From my own, uh perspective and I I'm my perspective is very privileged because I understand there's some people who are in Canada and 
don't have access to this. But for me, uh, my family was a very important part of being resilient because when I first came to Canada for like six years, we lived in an all white community. So there was nobody else. There was no like support system. There was no support group. There were no kids that looked like me. Um, so like my resilience came from my family because they were there and they were the only people I could lean on. Um, when I was experiencing any sort of racism or discrimination. Um, but yeah, I think that that was my main source of um, support. Um, but for some kids, it's just, they just come here maybe as like international students and they come here alone. So not everybody has access to family at some points. So yeah. Thank you, Inzwi. Sarah, Ryan, any thoughts? Um, thank you for this question. I think something that I've found interesting is that often um, with the youth that I've interacted with who are new to Canada is that within um, the community, sometimes they'll try to stick to what they already know and stick to the people that they already know if they can find them. And to that, I say, obviously, it's hard. <laughs> and of course, there's going to be um, other variables that come into play. But I think it's very important and very interesting to realize and make sure that there are are more than just the worldview that you have right now, that there's more to see and there's more to learn. Because even for myself, um, I would often stick to the people that I knew and um, the ideas that I knew because that was taught to me. But as I've grown, I've realized that there's so much knowledge and learning from listening to other people and conversing with other people who don't look like me or might come from a different community than I do. So yeah, that's my response. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, you want to add something to that, especially in the context of being a young black male? Yeah, well, well, for me, I'd say you just have to, to look at the good stuff. And like you were saying, you have to find um support from your family if you came here alone i'm sure you still have family back home so you should find time to talk to them and to if you when you're talking to them you tell them your problems you tell them the good stuff that's going on in your life they will support you through it and they will cheer you on and also it's not about having many friends but if you have one or two who are like close friends it's more than enough you will be fine if you just do what you came for, if you just focus on yourself and yeah, that's all you have to do. You just have to not think deeply about the bad stuff or you, you throw yourself into depression. Uh, to add to that, I do wonder, I'm just uh, stretching out Franklin's question is that how much of our resiliency, of those resilient actions and behavior is really cover up to protect yourselves? Just something to think about, to push it out there. Um, Shelly Pick, there are racialized youth in very isolated rural communities. What can we in the church do to help connect or make space for them? Go ahead, anybody want to take that? Um, well, in the church, we, from past experience, you know, the church can do like outreach programs to communities. So if we continue doing those and making sure we go to the isolated or small communities, that would be great. And also, if, if there's funding, we can get them like to be online, to get them online so that they can they can communicate with other youth from the cities and then they can share their experiences and they can also, if there's any help they need, any information they need, 
they can also get it. Okay. Um, let's follow that up with a question from Sung Run. It is so painful to hear and realize that white colonizers control all the systems making radicalized and racialized and indigenous people compete for gaining only the limited parts of the of society. How do you as a panel think that to live in alternative ways against this killing competitions to live in more liberating and humane ways? Um, well, I think, um, so obviously there, w I think part of this answer has kind of been, um, or part of this question has kind of been answered with uh, space, creating space and the education portion of these things. Um, because even like as uh, W.E. Du Bois has kind of said with, the theory of double consciousness, which is when racialized or in particular black people see themselves in um, the view of the white supremacists as well as themselves. And so he kind of says that even though there was emancipation, so uh, slaves were freed. And even though there was enfranchisement, so people, black people, could get the right to vote, there's still this racism that's embedded within within society. And even though now there's like formal equality as in everyone is equal, equal in, the, in the law, that we still experience racism and we still experience these things. And so I think an interesting answer to that would be, again, creating space. And the education portion, um, just to touch on one of the questions from before about isolated rural communities, for example, because our retreat that we had, the Indigenous and Racialized Retreat, actually brought out people from isolated rural communities so that they could also have a chance to speak and listen and have community within um, the space and, and therefore bring like further learning and experience to people. And so I think a really big thing is just being aware and the education portion of that, being aware, educating and having that space open to us, those resources will help dull out that competition. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you speak of a commodifying earlier and it continues on with those whole thing of cap getting uh, wrapped into the capitalism game. And Inzwi, Ryan, any, any addition to that? Yeah, I definitely agree with Sarah. I think that creating these spaces um, cuts across that competitiveness because most of the time it's like, when you are among white people and like your whole life, you're literally told you have to be the best of the best just so you can get like half as much as others. And once you have the, once you're in the spaces where it's just indigenous or racialized people, you're like, what are we actually doing? Like, I feel like you act, you can get in the mindset of, um, like what Sarah said, I'm not trying to be the best anymore. I'm not trying to outdo anybody. We're here and we're sharing experiences that we all experience. And you start to realize that it's not a us versus them system. It's more like we have to come together and, you know, we have to, um, you know, try to find understanding within each other because there's so many intersectionalities between racialized and uh, indigenous people. Um, so yeah, definitely creating spaces is very important. Okay, thank you very much. There's another uh, three more questions left here, and uh, we'll do that, and then we'll end with that. Um, from Maureen Okonde, um, talks about Sarah about impairing ourselves as racialized vulnerable people and to step into the vulnerability of crossing the boundaries that keep us separate and reach out. So the question is to all of the panelists. What can the church do to help racialized people cut across those barriers 
between each other. In short, how can we come together rather than be separated? Um, we just have to be aware of the situation and also understand that we all came from, even though we came from different places, the background is almost similar. We were colonized by a certain race. They, they, um, they cut short of our opportunities. And if we can, if we can um, use that to come together, then that would be a good thing. Instead of looking at each other like competition, like we're different, like he's black, I'm not, they're brown. But we start looking at each other as human beings who, who historically were exploited. We can work together to come up with something. Any additions to that? Um, to kind of add to that as well, to cut these barriers um, between each other, which I actually find this question to be super interesting because this is often what I've asked myself as well because I know that I have these feelings of superiority sometimes in a, with a certain group and at other times I have these feelings of inferiority and then that supplements my need for wealth, economic gain, whatever. Uh, and so something that I think has helped me um, try to cut the barriers that I've made for myself to kind of remove them and let other people into the space and realize that I'm not the only one here who's trying to make it in the world or trying to just survive as a human and be treated as an equal as a human. Um, is actually through people, not just people, but especially people in um, a position of authority to me, telling me that it is okay to just be me, that I myself am more than enough. Like I don't need to be competing with other people to be heard in that particular space. So I think a lot of it just comes with understanding and listening. And even with our presentations that we have right now, it's another opportunity to understand and to listen and to further take what you've learned and then adjust it with different people that you meet in your everyday lives, indigenous people, racialized people that you meet in everyday lives to be able to speak to them in a more personalized way that, that, that counteracts these boundaries. Thank you very much. Um, Am I frozen here? No, okay. So let me just put the last two questions together and we'll end with it. The, la the one is that what or who do you draw hope from as we all wait to change the system of racism in Canada? More specifically, perhaps, if you can do it in the United Church of Canada. And what piece of advice or knowledge would you tell someone considering a move to Canada? So either one or if you want to address both, just we'll, and then we'll end with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think seeing myself in other people, so particularly seeing other youth who are racialized or indigenous in leadership roles or seeing them participate within the church in some capacity is very helpful to me. Um, it makes me feel hopeful that maybe one day um, that can be me or it's very nice to see someone else succeed in that way or, you know, be in that position where 
you know, that I, most of the times I just see a white person take. Um, I think that's where a lot of my hope comes from. And um, it's really empowering and it's really powerful to see that. And I think, especially if we're going to create spaces for Indigenous and racialized people, um, it has to be by Indigenous and racialized people. I think that's very important because in, then we can see that, you know, it's coming from someone who can understand our experiences, who can, who can understand what we need um, and where our mental, you know, awareness is. And then for someone who might be coming to Canada, I would say maybe do research <laughs> and like do lots of research and talk to people who are already there who might know the experience, the experiences of, of being in Canada or of being a, um, uh, uh, a racialized person in Canada. I think that would be very helpful. Thank you, Enzui. Mm -hmm. Sarah, Ryan, this will be your last uh, word for tonight before we end. Okay. Um, thank you, Enzui. Uh, I'll let you say that it's uh, inspiring. Also, um, I would draw inspiration from like my generation or these young people because I know with the way social media is working now, we are uh, we actually one of the the frontliners in conveying our information and data to everyone else. So with all this, like the Black Lives Matter, with the issues of like the murders in Toronto and uh, all those stuff, people were sharing it on their profiles. They were sharing it on their stories, making sure that everyone knows we were seeing petitions be signed with all that stuff. So the fact that the young generation is working towards making the world or Canada a better place for everyone, it's something that I'm happy for. And on someone coming to Canada, I would say people are friendly here, but not everyone is your friend. <laughs> you have to know your boundaries with people and and whatever you do, just make sure you just live your life and take care of yourself. And Sarah, since you didn't migrate here, what do you say? Go ahead. <laughs> um, specifically for one piece of advice that I would tell someone um, considering moving to Canada, or I guess in my uh, answer would be someone who is moving to Canada, is it's not you it's not your fault it's you it's kind of, it's kind of like um what Kamala Harris said that you exist in the within the context and so issue your issues they're not completely yours and your faults or your mistakes they're also not completely yours as there's so many structures such as systemic racism um, capitalism and colonialism that uh, sways our actions and how we live today. And that's kind of what Canada is. Um, you know, it's very neoliberal and, and capital, capitalistic. And so I would say if you are feeling internalized racism, or if you do feel like you are impeding on other people, then there you go you have this this point you're at this point and now you can make a change you can adjust your thinking to that and so yeah just in essence it's not sometimes it feels it's easy to be negative and and give yourself negative self-talk but it's not completely you as you exist within the context of things um just to everyone, before we go, and Adele have, might have the one more word, but uh, thank you very much again for tuning in and and and, and joining into tonight's uh, event. I'd just like to read the last two thank yous from all of you who've written uh, towards uh, Sarah, Ryan, and Inzurashi. Um, the the words that came out here is that thank you to this. This is just a summary for of what everybody's pretty much said. Thank you to this evening speakers. Listening to our younger generation is very enlightening and inspiring. And the last one comes in at um, 
Excellent panel. I appreciate the wisdom, honesty, and vulnerability of Inzwi, Ryan, and Sarah. Thanks for creating space. Folks, thank you for tuning in and, 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 and encouraging our young, our young people. Blessings to everybody. Thank you. Adel, off to you. Thank you. Yes, blessings to everyone. Thank you again to Ensby, Ryan, and Sarah for being here and sharing your honest perspectives. And thank you to Emma for facilitating the conversation. Um, to everyone who's here, uh, there's a feedback survey that the link is in the chat. If you're able to pull that out, it will just take two minutes uh, to share your thoughts and perspectives. Um, and the recording for this gathering will be available within the next couple of days. So if there's other people you think would benefit from hearing these powerful stories, uh, please feel free to share that. So thank you all for being here and continued blessings to you all. And thanks uh, as well to Brian, who is doing quiet tech in the background. So thank you everyone and blessings on your day.